working now. Okay, welcome to Growing Down Podcast, Episode 7. Uh, today we are joined by Edward Burge. Uh, welcome, Edward. Thank you. So, Ed, uh, you and I and the th- uh, four of us have been conversing a lot on the Integral Left uh, Facebook forum. And um, if you don't mind, uh, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Just tell us a little bit about how you um, got into Integral. We've seen you've been, I've seen you on the Integral forums for at least a decade. So we've been in mutual circles for a long time. Well, um, I was there at the very early days of the Integral Institute when we used to meet in uh, Ken's cabin in Boulder. Uh, Ken at that time had already moved to Denver and he didn't participate in these meetings, but the early meetings um, were run by, and I can't remember their names, it's been so long, um, but a group of older folks who were trying to organize the Institute. And when I showed up on the scene, uh, they were already being replaced by what's euphemistically known as Ken's kids. So, um, I came up, I was living in Colorado Springs at the time and I would come up to those meetings. I probably came up for a couple months and um, then the Integral Institute started doing um, seminars, sort of, um, at a place in a hotel between Boulder and Denver. And they were kind of like experimental seminars to get an idea of how to organize the whole thing. And I participated in most of those, including some with Ken and a variety of other guests. And from there, um, I moved on to this thing called the Integral Post-Metaphysical Spirituality Forum on Ning which is kind of more like an archive now, originated by Bruce Alderman, who I would highly recommend doing one of these with. He's uh, one of my comrades in arms in exploring variations on the integral theme. And we've been doing that for about a decade and now it's on Facebook. It's been on Facebook the last couple of years, which is where the forum kind of moved to, because most people find Facebook easier to use, I guess, and there's more people doing it. So we've been doing that for the last couple of years. And in the interim, I've you know written a few articles here and there on Integral World and a couple other sources. I think the most recent of which I was promoting on the Integral Left Facebook group from capitalism to the collaborative commons which is basically uh, nothing new. I've, it's mostly a compilation of things I've written over the years on the IPS forums. And um, I've kind of moved on from so-called the integral model to the last few years being more involved in you know, direct political engagement, like supporting Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, whatnot. Um, trying to get, um, apply some of these ideas that you know, we've expounded upon over the years into political engagement and how do we affect, enact these ideas into policy that help people in the world. So that's been my main focus the last couple of years is the political realm and that pretty much brings us up to today. Excellent. So you've been you've been at this since the beginning. It sounds like from the very beginning, yes. Yeah. So how would you say, kind of just your trajectory from where it started to where it is now? Is it kind of how you envisioned it? Are you surprised about where we are at? Or what are your thoughts? Yes, um, that's one of the things that um, I want to for us to discuss as a topic is. I had no idea it would end up here, uh, and I still have no idea where it's going. 
because I'm trying to leave myself open to possibilities. And for me, that's one of the challenges we have in model building because we tend to get attached to our models and, and uh, not be so much open to new things that arrive that change could change everything. Um, so that's one of the things I've written about. In fact, one of the articles I posted a link to is do our models get in the way? And it's something that I think I heard Brent talk a little bit about in his presentation that um, sometimes we get so attached to what we think we know and what we think we're going that we miss what's in front of us all the time. And this, I think this pandemic, which we should also do a little discussion on, has kind of shaken up everything, not just integral, but the entire socioeconomic system, the entire way that we've led our lives in the past, and that may be something positive that comes out of it is that we need to re-examine a lot about what we assumed reality was and, and how we look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, um, I was taking a look at the, that piece that you shared and we'll leave that in the show notes for those of you who are curious, do our models get in the way? Um, it seems like, this has been a theme that has been cropping up pretty much everywhere, not only from, let's say, the, the Bernie Sanders campaign and the left, which is we thought we understood, um, you know, the, the, the political situation. We thought we understood the, the voting landscape and there was a sudden turnaround. Right. And the centrist and institutional establishment um, played it a certain way. Maybe we weren't really expecting. I mean, we were expecting resistance and consolidation. But at this kind of scale and sort of weaponizing the media landscape in the way that they did um, really kind of set us, not set us back per se, but it's, it's really kind of forced us to pause for a moment and go, how do we effectively use the media landscape to reach everyday people? We thought we were reaching them, right? Um, so, so yeah, just this questions of labor and the working class and the consolidation of power by neoliberalism has been something that has come up for our podcast uh, quite a bit recently. Um, but then I think the other side, the other trend, which is why we wanted to have you on just, just in terms of your focus on the political has been um, trying to bring together our models, our theories about the evolution of consciousness with much more on the ground, political, economic, material realities. And I, I, we're not trying to reduce it, right? We're not trying to approach it in a reductive sense, but to try to actually have literacy for, you know, the material basis of politics and then also flip that around to how do we transform politics? How do we transform the material basis of society? Like, in my mind, integral should be in the middle of that question constantly. You know, that should just be whether you consider it a dialectic or um, maybe more Gebsarian way, um, you know, just a perspectively the outer and the inner always having a conversation or a dialogic with each other. This isn't really a question. This is just sort of like what comes up when I think of your work and, and what you've been presenting with uh, uh, to us recently in the forum. So I don't know if you want to riff on that. Well, um, and that's one of the things I'm hoping for here is for you guys to also do some riffing and we can share some information. But I was not at all surprised by the establishment democratic media blitz and the inside machination, machin, machinations, there we go, got it out, of how they manipulated the system to basically thwart the Bernie movement yet again. And they will, they will continue to constantly do that. So one of the issues that has come up for me in regards to that, and that I've posted about on the Integral Left uh, Facebook group, is that um, many of us Bernie supporters are disillusioned, and rightly so, because they've done it again. And 
Biden is now our choice, whether we like it or not. So I'm having to, as I did in 2016, have a conversation with those progressives who supported Bernie, who refused to support Hillary at the time. Hence, now we have a, a fascist wannabe who may become a fascist in reality in what I call the Blight House. So I'm trying to encourage us progressives to conditionally support Biden because we our main focus really needs to be to defeat Trump. And I know that we're not happy about that. I'm not happy about that. But there is a lesser and a greater evil here. And this is something that is not getting through to some progressive. Yes, their criticisms of Biden are all accurate and true. He is more of the neoliberal camp. But the points that Chomsky and Scahill have made recently and others is we have, unfortunately, we have a choice between neoliberalism and neo-fascism. And I am certain, as are those authors, that if Trump is reelected, we're going down that road on an accelerating pace. And I personally see it as a reenactment of what happened in Nazi Germany. We may not be even be able to meet like this online. So faced with that, we as progressives can still maintain our agendas, still fight like hell for that agenda. But we're going to have to do it in down ticket races all the way down to local political offices. And like the Republicans, they've been on their agenda for the past 40 years in incremental change. And I admire them for that because we progressives, we want everything, we've got to have it now. We need to realize this is a long-term war. We need to fight it one battle at a time. And just because Bernie didn't win, that doesn't mean we give up and not participate. Yeah, so one question I have, Edward, is um, at the beginning you had mentioned that you're now applying or trying to apply some of these integral ideas and insights to really catalyze some concrete political socioeconomic transformation. So my question is, what do you think integral and everything that we've studied can really bring to the table that can enrich or change politics? And like, what can we contribute to the conversation that can be different than standard progressive politics, such as Bernie Sanders or, or Elizabeth Warren's ideas? Well, I've also encountered this before and had various discussions and arguments about this in the various animal forums throughout the year. And I really don't think that selling the integral model to corporate leaders is going to have much effect in that regard. And I really don't think using the language of the integral model and its jargon when we speak to the working class is going to have any effect because that in itself is part of what they perceive as the elite. And, this, and their eyes glaze over and they go, talk to me in my term. And this is, of course is a standard operating procedure for integral in itself is know your audience and talk to them, not at them, not down to them. So that's why in my blog and in my discussions online, I just try to talk in the words of like, in the frames of Bernie Sanders, who I think frames the issues actually perfectly by speaking the language of the working class. So, and there are various um, methods of doing that from, I think that was another topic I saw recently on the Integral F Forum. Uh, someone posted an article about, you know, do we be nice about it? No, we're fighting fascism here. We're not, we, this polemic. Polemic is an effective tool and an effective frame. The right and dump uses it all the time. So progressives need to learn to fight fiercely and use the sort of language that actually moves the working class 
who we are fighting for to initiate legislation that helps them. And we don't do that by talking down to them and using all this jargon. Hence why I rarely, even though I'm trying to apply the principles of things like the interval model, I don't speak in those terms. And I don't think we should if we want to actually affect people's voting behavior because we need to win elections to enact these policies. So for me, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren frame it just right. And in that sense, I think they are able to motivate us to enact some of these high-minded principles we talk about. So we need to, you know, talk the language. Go ahead, Jeremy. No, go ahead, Matt. I, I need a moment to, I think, formulate my thought anyway. Yeah, I, I, there's, a, I think, a lot of different ways we can go about discussing this. I think we're trying to integrate, at least from my perspective, um, some pretty vast range of topics. Um, and so trying to also not just have a Q&A with Edward, trying to think of best of how we can have sort of a, a, a discussion about all the different ideas that Integral brings to the table and, and kind of what makes someone an Integral progressive. Um, so I know like reading your paper, Edward, from capitalism to the collaborative commons, um, you're hitting on a theme that I think we're, we've discussed in the last couple shows and on the next show about um, sort of how the economic model ties into spirituality. Um, and I know your paper talked about that. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what you mean by that? Well, um, and this comes into the very diagram I put at the top of the paper of kind of like intersecting circles, intersecting holons and the spaces between. And that was the point I opened the paper with, the spirituality of economics. Sometimes our models, like an Aqual model, we have these strict dividing lines this is this quadrant, this is this quadrant. And even though there is some validity and usefulness to using that for analysis purposes, then we need synthesis purposes. How do those quadrants interrelate? How do they interact? How do they constrain and support each other? So, I talked about the spirituality of economics as being one of those spaces between this whole on spirituality and this whole on economics. And this also relates to a lot of other topics on, you know, even the model of hierarchical complexity, how we formulate, you know, how we've developed our models of development. Um, I always, always uh, reference Mark Edwards and his work uh, on um, what he calls integrality. And that's what I'm talking about is how is economics a spiritual pursuit? And I, you know, quoted five or six, maybe half a dozen people that speak to that, that what could be more spiritual than helping people have the material necessities so that they can actually move up a developmental hierarchy, developmental progression. Uh, there's no question that we can't engage self-actualization if we are struggling to eat and pay the bills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And in the past, to me, that has been one of the challenges of the intro movement is how do we feed people as opposed to how do we feed them a model? Because they don't want a model, they want food, they want a job, they want you know, benefits, which is a prerequisite for even attempting to engage some kind of intellectual model about what development means. So to me, that is the most spiritual way we can engage to help people is through the political system, to making laws 
then help people move up Maslow's hierarchy. I think that's even part of the prime directive of you know integral theory itself. How do we move people up that scale? The, what's, there's another word for that, another expression for that. I can't remember it offhand, but it's a conveyor belt or something like that. You know, we need to deal with people where they are. And, well, you know, we're relatively privileged white guys. Or so to me, that's how the spirituality meets the road of economics. So I want to hear some of your opinions on what we just what I just said. Yeah, I just want to say that um this is very resonant with uh, what Brent Cooper is up to with meta modern politics because um at least this is the impression I get in and how Hanzi creates this framework of cultural evolution and kind of goes you know we need a society that is um that has grown down enough in the foundations, right? That has a strong enough foundation to allow individuals to explore the more rarefied sublime moments, the more transpersonal dimensions of existentialism of their life, of their self-actualization. And the only way to do that is to have, you know, so, some basic common decency in terms of, you know, taking care of people, a human centric economy, et cetera. So I, I find a lot of alignment here actually in, um, what, what kind of, I know Hansi, Hansi wouldn't like this, but you know, he was deeply influenced by integral theory. And I think in, in many ways, developmental metamodernism is kind of a riff on integral theory and what it was doing, but just turned towards the political, maybe with his own kind of, um, intellectual milieu and his own influences. But, um, that's, that's what comes to mind here, just in terms of seeing this as, uh, taking care of the foundations to allow for self-actualization in a society that that flourishes in that way to occur. And what a long way off we are from that, right? I mean, even in the Nordic countries, uh, just thinking about human civilization as a whole, you know, there's just so much that needs to be worked on in terms of that ideal principle. Um, I don't know, Matt or Ryan, if you want to jump in here with some thoughts on the, the conveyor belt or uh, integral theory in politics. Oh, I mean, I, I totally resonate with all of it. I think this theme was probably a big inspiration for starting this podcast in the first place and, and, and the name Growing Down and that turn towards the importance of material reality and to see how much of an impact the socioeconomic conditions play in our human development and the unfolding of consciousness that we're all aiming at ultimately, right? And I think for a lot of us, especially I'll uh, speaking for myself, my frustration with some of these very insular privileged communities and Hansi jokes about it in a really funny way. He calls it like the yoga bourgeois, you know, and the, the integralists are kind of at the top of this um, hierarchy where a lot of our material needs are kind of taken care of. You know, one of my friends was saying that one of the shadows of game B is that everyone who's involved in game B already won game A. And so then they have the ability to go and pursue something like a game B. And I can speak for myself too. I've had an incredibly privileged and blessed life where my material conditions were never really an issue. And so the most spiritual and intellectual development I've had has come the last few years where I've only worked 15 hours a week and I can devote the rest of my time to reading and podcasting and meditating and that kind of thing. So I think it's easy to overlook the importance of these really basic things when when you take them for granted and to really consciously highlight and, and this is something that layman pascal says about how in the quadrants the lower right quadrant is kind of the hardest to understand and to see because we all have behaviors we all have inner processes we all have social relationships but to really understand how much the container the structural container that we're swimming in shapes and influences our lives is something that you have to be a little bit more literate or cognizant of um, it's not something as direct as the other experiencing the other quadrants. So that's a, that's a huge uh, part of why I think this podcast has the, the energy and legs that it, that it does. Well, I appreciated Hanzi noting that his, I'm trying to think of what he calls green liberal socialism, is that it? Is an extension of the 
social democracies of the Nordic societies because they have learned how to take care of at least some of this and address um, a, a social safety net to allow people to take care of their basic needs so that they can experience what we can generally call happiness. The happiness report comes out every year and Nordic countries are always on the top of the list. And why? Because they are also on the top of the list of the democracy index, meaning, you know, actual citizen participation in government and getting their goals and needs met so that they could move up this ladder and can do things like meditation or study politics. I remember when I was a kid, we actually had civics in grade school to teach us about the political system. I don't think they have that anymore. And most people that um, are trying to work for a living have no time to learn about the political system or to engage with it. Hence, even people identify as Democrats they just, you know, are manipulated to vote for what the establishment, you know, manipulates them to vote for because they don't have the time to, you know, examine the issues and examine the candidates and their agenda. And so I like very much Hansi's framing of liberal, green liberal socialism 2.0. But we in America have to get up to liberal Green liberal socialism 1.0. And that is where I tend to focus my energy, at least through rhetoric and framing in my blog, trying to reach an audience to inform them and get them supporting these kinds of agendas so they do get a little bit politically active to, you know, vote for their school board and vote for their city council, all the way up to, you know. Congress and the Senate and the President. We all need to participate. That's what this democracy is supposed to be, you know, citizen participation in government. They are supposed to work for us. And I think people, even so-called ignorant people that don't have the time to learn this stuff, they, they get this and that's why People like Sanders and Warren speak to them because, and I think a large part of why Trump even won in the first place is because we know the system is rigged and we know we're not doing well and we need to change that. So we need to get up to this kind of social democracy that the Nordic countries have had for a couple of decades. And that's my focus, just getting us up to par. And I think that's why I support Sanders and Warren and AOC and the squad, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because the more we get people like that in government, the closer we get to enacting, getting up to that speed. And of course, that's a long, long process that we all need to get involved with day to day. And not throw up her hands and just say, I quit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's been um, quite a divide in the, in the post. Uh, well, you know, since Bernie has uh, actively stepped out of the race, he's still on the, he's still on the ballot, I think in some States, although that is being contested. I recently heard that he might be removed from New York state's ballot, unfortunately, mm -hmm. which is just, you know, there, there's the reason for that. And I, I do think it was on Bernie's part, very strategic to remain on the ballot as a kind of um, bargaining chip when we get to the convention to really wield some political power um, and not just concede to whatever the uh, the Biden uh, campaign or administration is, 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 you know, legislating for, but to actually kind of substantively enact and promise to enact progressive economic policy. Um, and this is really what we have to do, as you're saying, from from the down ballot up is to push for that and to participate, et cetera. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are and all of our thoughts are on this bifurcation that has now happened in the progressive vote. Um, there's the never Biden folks, um, a number of 
progressive media hubs have suggested, you know, um, not voting for Biden and using this in, in a way as a kind of a negative power, right? Like, um, I forget, Ryan, you and I were talking about this, um, the, the, uh, the progressive voice, I forget which podcaster it was, which YouTuber, he's on the Hill quite a bit, but he had this tweet that went out, um, which, which spurred on a debate basically saying like, yeah, I'm not going to vote for Biden and you can blame me. You can blame me for it, and then maybe we, let's talk about the next one. So there's that argument, and then there's the Chomsky argument and the argument you're making, Ed, which is, look, you know, we're depending on how you see the danger. You know, we need to vote very strategically and understand that we're voting in an enemy that we want to be our enemy, right? Like we would rather Biden be the enemy that we fight against and force to legislate more to the left than be in an administration with Trump with everything else that goes along with that. So there's a lot of like pros and cons here. And, you know, even like Crystal Ball from the Hill has been arguing for, well, maybe we should weaponize our vote, you know, this time. Maybe we should be the ones who are threatening to blow everything up in order to um, actually wield some economic, not economic, um, some voting power, some voting power block, because the progressives always yield every four years. There's always somebody who's dangerous in power, and we always yield to the centrist because we don't want the more dangerous um, president in office. So what do, you, what do you guys think of this ongoing debate? It seems to have reached ahead this time, even with Trump in office, and some of the progressives are finally saying no. Others are saying if this was any other election, yes, but not this time. What do you guys think? I mean, for me, Jeremy, it's, I, I mean, this has been going back since I can recall ever since, you know, at least 2002, I think with Nader and the, you know, should we, should you waste a vote kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. For me, my energy is more about, and Edwards talks about this in his paper about, we need a new story, whether that be a meta narrative, meta politics, Andres was talking about it last week. There's an incoherent narrative that the progressives have, and that's why we're so splintered. And it's and it seems like while you know there might be some our models, you know I don't think we're advocating for just getting rid of our models, but it's how do we create a good model, a good map, so we're aware of the territory. And so I think one of the influences for this podcast is to talk to other integralists, loose identify somewhat with this model to, to try to identify what are our common themes and how do we unite around that vision? Because I'm not even sure, while I know Edward was sort of talking about how Bernie kind of really had a good synthesis of that, I still think even in his narrative he was putting out to the public, just take democratic socialism, no one has an idea really of the working class, what the hell that even means. And, and so I think it's worth sort of exploring these fresh ideas and trying to identify how do they resonate with the American public and how do they resonate with the progressives? Um, wow, there's a lot there. Um, AOC has also come out and saying she's going to vote for Biden and support him. And on the other hand, I agree with Crystal, who I really like, I post her stuff a lot that we also need to use our power of the vote to fight back. Now, AOC is continuing to do that. I think she's just, you know, the squad has just come out on the recent so-called stimulus package that is most of the money to the rich people and screws the rest of us. And if I'm not mistaken, I think she voted against it. So we need to use that sort of power contextually in the appropriate places. I don't think, and this is where I disagree with Crystal and some of the people that agree with her, that we need to do that with Biden. Because from my experience following the Democratic Party for a long time, they don't give a shit if we say we're not gonna vote for Biden. And I'm really even wondering if they even give a shit if they win. So in that particular instance, the consequence of our withholding our votes to punish the party isn't gonna punish them because they don't care. They're gonna keep up doing what they do. 
What it is going to do is reelect Trump. And I am convinced, given his accelerating slide into fascism, that that's going to go insane if he's reelected. There's going to be really very dire consequences. And I'm not just me. I've been reading, you know, a lot of history on how the Nazis came to power, how uh, that fascism came to be from people who know that from the inside, who are also saying America looks like the beginnings of fascism in the early 30s of Germany. So in the case of Biden versus Trump, I agree with Chomsky, Scahill, and others that there is a far greater evil here. And at least with Biden, even though he's more on the neoliberal side, we will have at least some influence and some impact of getting at least some degree of progressive policy in the agenda and enacted. Yes, it won't be what we want exactly, but a little bit is better than not just nothing, but fascism. So, and yes, the same argument that Matt was bringing up, Bernie is not an integralist and doesn't you know, promote these ideas, but he is a step in that direction. So I'm not going to you know, tell Bernie to read up an integral theory. I'm going to appreciate him moving us at least in that direction. So if we don't, I'm, I'm serious, if we don't want to go down the complete fascist road, and that's not going to happen with Biden, yes, we're going to get a bunch of you know continuing corporate influence and policy, but the more we elect progressives like AOC and the squad and Bernie into those bodies, I think right now the Congressional Progressive Caucus in the House has close to 100 members, which is about 42% of the entire Democratic uh, Party. Well, we're not that far off from getting 51% if we just keep working at it. And if we can just flip a few in the Senate and get more progressives like Bernie in the Senate and more like Warren in the Senate, we can actually have real power down the road. That possibility remains open to us with a Biden presidency. It does not. In fact, we go back several steps if Trump is reelected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something um, actually Cenk uh, from the Young Turks was mentioning. Just if we get Biden in, the the challenge of the down ballot will be so much um, more on our side, right? That we, we've been kind of stuck these past four years in this emergency situation where experimenting with pro economic progressivism on the down ballot. I mean, we've had mixed success because there's been a lot of pushback, right? There's been a lot of pushback because no, no, we're not, we're not in normal circumstances. We can't risk something economically experimental or progressive. We just need to consolidate uh, the Democratic Party and get the centrist in and vote them in in the down ballot. And maybe in the future we'll get progressive. And that, that's been the argument. So Cenk is saying basically his argument is we will have a much better shot at transforming the down ballot during a Biden administration than we would during a um, Trump administration because the DNC will be in emergency mode and that will be the way to legitimize any argument against progressives that look it's too risky right now those are great ideals but we need to restore the country and get out of you know this backsliding into fascism so um, we would be in a much better place and this is just his argument I, I'm kind of on the fence um, I think we've seen a lot of economic progressivism rise up due to the loss of Hillary to some degree. I think it's a mixed bag. But at this point, I'm kind of in agreement with you, Ed, and with Chomsky that um, I don't know if, if Trump is the next Hitler or not. I've, I've read some of these articles. I've, I've seen the research. I think it's it's fairly, 
we are we are getting closer into orbit just in terms of policies and me being like a, an immigrant and a Mexican American, that some of the legislation he's been enacting has been dangerously close to home. You know, like this is not something I can kind of go like, oh, that's sad that that's happening to those people. It's like it might be happening to me, you know, in the next year or two. What else is he going to pass? So I've been weighing those pros and cons as well. But I, I do like Chenk's argument that um, perhaps in a Biden administration, we'd have a better shot at transforming the down ballot. And uh, that could mean a lot, you know, in, in the next four to eight to 12 years and just sort of transforming the landscape of the Democratic Party for the better. And I know we hate to hear that, right? Like, oh, we have to wait four to eight or 12 years before we can have someone like Bernie have another shot, you know? But, you know, I think we have to be like Michael Brooks says, just profoundly realistic about this and have a sense of what you're saying, the long war, right? This is the kind of Machiavellian spirituality that Brooks always talks about. So, um, yeah, what are, you, what are you guys' thoughts? Well, first of all, Elizabeth Warren is in the running for VP. And given Biden's seemingly accelerating slide into the mental cognitive issues. She might even take over as president in his first term. And if she does, and we can flip the Senate, we can even, this could even be a quicker, um, a quicker move to what we want than we're hoping for. So I think that is one of the things that we can do right now is try to influence our own circles and share as much as we can with pressure on Biden to choose her as his VP. Because if he does, if he wants to win, and if Democrats really want to defeat Trump, they're going to need Bernie's voters because they're hearing all this stuff that we hear. Progressives, never Biden, never Biden, no, 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 no. Well, I think we might change, flip some of them if he chooses Warren as his VP, because then even in the long term, if Biden survives the first term, she's going to be given probably some power to do some stuff on her own. And again, if Having her as VP is far better than having, you know, another neoliberal as VP. So we can apply pressure individually and in groups and, and constantly hounding the Biden campaign to choose her, making the argument that if he wants to win, that's what he has to do. I think that is an incredible step towards enacting the kind of agenda we really want. Um, Ryan, I know you have some thoughts on Warren. Did you, did you, do you share the same way Edward shares or, or thinks the same way? Yeah, I mean, so I probably will vote for Biden. I, I agree a lot with what Edward is saying. Um, my The thought that I have about a, a Biden presidency is that I, I really look at Trump's election in, in 2016 as this kind of volcano eruption ushering in the post-establishment uh, era, <laughs> right? This populist rage and fervor was kind of unleashed uh, both politically and economically and culturally. And there is this sense, I just have it, it's, it, I kind of sense it in the zeitgeist. There's a sense of like, we can never truly go back to the way things were. And Biden is kind of like Hillary Clinton as the establishment neoliberal corporatist Democrat all over again. So the thought that comes up to me is, and you know, Rob had the, the article called The Great Release, right? Like there was this pressure valve that was building, that was cooking, that was kind of released. And I don't, to me, a Biden presidency feels like the lid is just being, like you're putting a bandaid on top of the volcano again. And I do worry about what would happen afterwards um, because that is what everyone is trying to get away from in terms of the populist and, and the progressives and the, the right wing populace of Trump's base. And I, I do wonder if that will actually 
fuel the explosion to be even worse. Um, that, that's kind of my only hesitation. It's more of an intuitive, emotional feeling rather than like a rational argument. That being said, I probably will still vote for Biden because I do, yeah, I, I do think there's a lot of merit to the lesser of the two evils uh, argument. It's not a sexy or exciting position, but sometimes we have to just hold our nose and vote and do the right thing. Uh, but I, I do have I do have some concerns about what will, it will look like down. Well, the what do you what do you think about um, Warren as VP pick? Do you think that would alleviate at least some of that um, fear? Yeah, I, I I would be way more. I mean, obviously Bernie's not going to be the VP pick, <laughs> but I think Warren would be the best possible option. I do wonder about how much the Bernie crowd. Ha, lately has really since 2016 has progressively disliked Warren more and more yeah, and more yeah. and there's quite a schism there uh, I don't know the data on Warren's base either in terms of if they um, leaned more into Bernie style AOC progressivism Warren seems at times to kind of be on the fence about like if she wants to be more of a establishment candidate or more of like a like a real bleeding heart progressive so I, I do wonder how if she is the VP pick how much that could mobilize the progressive base uh, and and how much um, they like her basically. Well, I know I've had my issues with Warren as well, especially in, in the primary with Bernie. And, but, you know, looking at her past history, um, forming the Consumer Financial Protection Agency and her votes in Congress and the issues that she vehemently fights for, a strong fight, strongly fights for mostly progressive agenda items. I've had to come back around to realizing of all the possible picks, she's the one at least the closest to um, Bernie's agenda. I think even Jake of uh, Young Turks really, really liked Warren um, and had arguments with Anna about supporting her because Anna was completely anti Warren. But I, I think progressives can more easily come around to someone like Warren as the pick than they could any of the other possible choices. So it's kind of a pragmatic strategy for the Biden campaign if they want to win. And it's also kind of an olive branch to the progressive forces of, you know, well, here's here. Uh, Here's something that is at least a little bit what you like. I know that Biden has already agreed to lower the Social Security age to 60, I believe. He's also agreed to forgive student debt loan for low-income families. These are concessions he's already made. And Bernie, I'm sure, will fight for more concessions and fight for more in the Democratic platform at the convention. We also have to get involved in that process and demand it of the Biden campaign, demand it of the Democrats. We need to continue to use our power in this long, slow war to get our agenda enacted. And I, like I said, I think if Biden is, if Biden chooses Warren as the VP pick, I think that's a huge step toward at least placating some of the progressives who are really pissed off. Will it placate them all? No. And like, you know, you made the arguments, you know, that Biden is still going down the same neoliberal path. But like Jenk has said, we have a much better chance of getting at least some of what we want through that. And I, we have to be practical about this. If you actually really want to get um, what we perceive as a progressive agenda and initiate something like an integral idea into government, this is going to be a long, low, or one battle at a time. I'm not excited about Biden, but I saw a meme the other day, which kind of highlights it for me. As we know, Trump suggested we drink Lysol. <laughs> So the meme for Biden is, I know I'm not your first choice, but at least I'm not telling you to drink Lysol. That kind of highlights it for me. Yeah. 
Uh, so maybe to, to kind of pivot a little bit back to um, some connections with integral theory and the integral community. Um, the, the question that keeps ringing in, in my mind is, is this, this one, do our models get in the way, right? And I think within the integral community, there's been, as Brent Cooper has been saying, it's almost a, a sort of Rorschach test for your own kind of political biases, right? People are taking integral theory and going, this guy's integral or this reason is integral. And it's all over the map. It's all over the political map, which for Brent raised the question of what is the usefulness of this map if it's not really giving us a compass, right? If it's not really giving us an orientation for social action for growing down. Um, now we could argue that maybe it's just bad interpretations of the map right? Just poor ones. But I'm kind of curious what everyone's take is on this, on this, because um, kind of the theme here, right? Like in, in your paper, uh, do our models get in the way is, is the question of like, okay, well, in order to have a model that is resonant with material realities on the ground, um, you mentioned Lakoff and Johnson, you mentioned a couple of other uh, thinkers in there. Um, sometimes the level of abstraction and complexity can really kind of get in the way and come up with strange results. So how can integral, this is, this is my more pointed question. How can integral theory um, get out of its own way and have a better clarity towards political action, transformative action, right? What needs to change? Maybe that's, that's a problem in integral theory. And what would you like to see more of just in terms of the shift in, in the theory practitioner um, bifurcation. I'd like to hear some of you guys' opinions first. Hmm. I mean, for me, Jeremy, the, the basic thing, or the thing for me, the compass is the basic moral intuition. So the greatest step for the greatest span. And so for me, how you identify a candidate is who is advocating to help those at the bottom of the ladder. How, how do you give that security net to make sure, as Edward was saying at the top, they can continue to climb that ladder? And when you kind of put it in a perspective of, I think what capitalism's main, you know, sort of the people that are complaining about capitalism is that it, it's a doggy -dog, dog world. And so people get left behind, the wealthy get richer. And for me, it's about how do you close the gap of wealth inequality, economic justice, and really don't leave people behind. And I think that, that would be my, that would be my answer for that. Right? Yeah, it's, it's really funny because in the last, really the last year or so, I've kind of pivoted away from Wilbur's version of integral theory and community, and I've been um, kind of converted, so to speak, by Jeremy and uh, Gebser, and Gebser's more kind of right-brained artistic approach because I, I found that the mapping and all of the abstraction and meta mapping, it, it became a little bit clunky and one step removed from reality, right? So we're, we became obsessed about debating the maps and about nitpicking certain things and debating how many angels fit on the head of a pin instead of actually doing something practical or tangible. And so I, I kind of developed a mild aversion to the emphasis on mapping as the only this kind of like I map therefore I am <laughs> um, kind of tendency that I've, I've seen and and going down that rabbit hole I think you get a lot of diminishing returns really quickly right and Bonita Roy has a great article where she attacks this and says like this is what happens is you, it becomes like to use you know Gebs, Gebser's term with the the mental and the perspectival it's mostly about distinguishing and cutting and making distinctions and ratioing and if you go down that rabbit hole it becomes just kind of perspectival madness and everyone's arguing about every little thing right and but there's no coherence or wholeness that that really should be present um so in terms of t thinking about political issues myself i've almost kind of veered away from thinking about it in terms of integral theory and i've kind of just explored other works and haven't really connected them back yet but my background is in uh, my trainings in mediation and conflict resolution. And so the one thing I, did, I do find helpful with the developmental model is to understand where people are at, as you were saying, Edward, and to really be able to communicate in an effective way that can captivate their moral intuitions and values. 
And I, I, I do find that to be very helpful. And even, even thinking about in terms of complexity, like you do have to tailor your message so that it really resonates with people where they are. And so part of my interest is to go straight to the Trump supporters or even, you know, Jeremy and I are going to talk to our friend Karen, who self-identifies as a centrist politically, and really just get into it, you know, and see if, if, if something can be negotiated or, or even seeing, seeing what makes people tick. Um, if you're a Trump supporter, why? Like, what, what makes you angry? Um, what are your needs are not getting met? What, do you, what, what identities or values do you feel like are not getting acknowledged by the mainstream? And, and maybe we can draw something out. So that's kind of, that's kind of how I apply it is I, I, just talking to people from different backgrounds and exploring the value and beauty and uh, goodness of their worldview and values and to try to reframe that in the most healthy way possible for the, for the whole. Well said, Ryan. Um, yeah, I think for me, uh, just the, obviously my, my emphasis on Gepser has um, really helped translate across different, uh, ironically, in a very kind of aqua way, translate across different disciplines. So I really like what Michelle Bowens is doing with um, with Peer to Peer Foundation and his his writing on transitioning to a more common-centric economy. I think that is very Gibsarian in its flavor, very perspectival. So I, I really think the, the, the usefulness or the tool of cultural phenomenology that Gebser talks about, um, where it is a, a rhizomatic approach to mapping, right? It's, it's open-ended, it's de descriptive, it's process-oriented, um, it's recognizing a certain sense of like, yeah, there is a whole wholeness here. There is a kind of a generality we can assess and make here, but we're not going to stylistically or in the attitude of, you know, the, the compulsive mapping and abstraction kind of totalize that theory. We're going to leave it open-ended and, and try to, um, as Ryan was saying, allow for the kind of the poetics, the phenomenology, the structure of feeling of a particular culture and life world to express itself, because then, then you kind of get a, um, you, you kind of see how that orientation towards the world manifests in a distributed way, um, on the left and on the right, economically speaking, artistically speaking. So, for me, it's this very, in a sense, it is very grounded, um, and I feel much more. This is just me, like. Like, like I am promoting integral, um, uh, Gibsarian integral, but like I feel much more in touch with what's going on on the ground, and I think the integral practitioner should be more like an artist, and that they are very sensitive to those structures of feeling, and that actually gets them beyond the theory and the abstraction, or through the theory and the abstraction, and and it might actually enable them and empower them to kind of get domains of knowledge that they wouldn't otherwise kind of grok because they kind of get the feeling behind it or the new attitude that uh, let's say an economist is coming up with something or a mathematician or an ecologist and like okay i get what like what nora bateson's doing with simothesi and the life sciences that's very much in this kind of integral turn uh, again what michelle bowens is doing what the the economic progressivism as this cultural phenomenon is doing right like what bruno latour is talking about with this gaia regime i think all of these things we we get a better sense of coherence if we have a cultural phenomenology in our training um and it doesn't discount integral theory necessarily i just think it's it's something that has to be instilled kind of before and after integral theory, right? So you don't get catapulted into these realms of abstraction. And what we're seeing in integral theory is like what we're seeing everywhere else on the internet, right? Like we're seeing hyper fragmentation where everyone has their own little microcosmic view, their own perspectival cone of reality that they've taken this great abstract theory with and ran with. And they could be pro, you know, conservative, intellectual, dark web, integral theory folks, pro Peterson folks, or they could be super leftists, Michael Brooks show, like, like myself, right? And like, like all that stuff and call it integral. So, so what's going on maybe in the integral community is just a symptom of this hyper fragmenting perspectival culture. But if our theories themselves and the culture around the theory are just unapologetically embracing, you know, 
perspectival th- styles of thinking that what do we expect to get you know <laughs> like if we haven't overcome that ourselves in our theory and in our uh, in our particular culture then of course we're going to just replicate what's going on in the culture as a whole like in our own microcosm we'll have our own culture war right so i have a lot of a lot of comments about about that but that's all i'd like to to mention at the moment um how about you ed have you guys read jennifer gidley's phd dissertation comparing um wilbur Gebser, and steiner i've read i've read a bits and pieces over the years but um not recently well, she, she talks about several of the themes, Jeremy, that you were just talking about. Um, um, one of which is, and comes back to this thing I call higher anarchical simplexity. Um, and my critique of the model of hierarchical complexity in this essay I did, the root of the power law of religion which comes back to Lakoff and Johnson's work in framing. All kinds of interrelations here. Um, but part of the point is, you know, and I made in my article that you guys read from uh, Capitalism to the Collaborative Commons. What is transcended and included? What is transcended and replaced? If I'm not, I don't know a lot about Gibson, but from what I've read, it seems like the stages are mutation. They aren't really, to me, that focuses on what um, Zach Stein said in the Integral Theory Conference and what I said in my paper about worldviews being transcended and replaced. Um, Wilbur talked about. Um, basic and transitional structures, which I highlighted in my paper. What is included and what is replaced? And while we can include basic elements from previous worldviews, the worldviews themselves, in a developmental sense, replace the previous worldview. I quoted Wilbur on this in two or three places in the paper that I think he also applied it to, you know, um, values, value structures. So we don't just transcend and include everything. We don't include the worldview of capitalism with the worldview of the collaborative commons. We can include some of the elements of conscious capitalism, as I noted. But the worldview shift itself, which is the organizing paradigm, um, I see more as a perspectival, integral a perspectival, which can take include a number of perspectives, but itself doesn't isn't just another perspective to replace them. It's how they disintegrate, uh, which is a whole new worldview in itself, which is what I'm calling higher anarchical, higher anarchical simplexity. Uh, Lakeith and Johnson talk about this in some of the, um, that, that, their theory has been going on for a long time, going way back to, um, trying to think of her name, but um, basic categories, how we structure cognition, basic categories. And, um, Basic categories are not like in a hierarchical manner that don't go from the bottom to the top, but they work from the middle out. So most hierarchical complexity models start with basic premises that get more abstract into from the particular to the general abstraction. And in reality, the way our brains work is we start with basic categories like chair that we can relate to, something concrete that we can touch, which is not a very specific kind of chair and not the general notion of chair. When you talk about the general generality of chair, people are like, 
So it starts with the concrete, and Piaget also talks about this too, concrete, concrete operational thinking is how we interact with the world. Same thing with Lake Up and Johnson. And how do we extend those basic categories and those concrete operations of our uh, sensory, sensory motor operations with the world? How do we extend that to abstract systems? Well, they claim it's through metaphor. And so metaphor isn't just an artistic term. That means, you know, how is one thing like another, but it's how our cognition actually works. Since they came out with this in the 70s and 80s, there's been an enormous amount of work, empirical work on this that I've um, provided in various places at the IPS forum and other places of how this is going to the neural theory of language itself that's being worked on at UC Berkeley in the International Computer Science Institute. Going back to how the brain works and how our cognition works and how we create models so that I'm thinking more like Gebser and what you just said, Jeremy. Um, it's, it's not this strict model building that is hierarchical in itself but how hierarchy takes account of what is outside of itself and what is outside of the model. Uh, I think you guys have referenced object-oriented ontologies in a few places. They also talk about this. Um, I, I've read um, Levi, I can't remember his last name. Uh, he, he wrote a book about this. And it talks about exactly this, these phenomena, how we organize structure, not just structure that is existing in the, the manifest realm, but the virtual realm, how we also construct virtuality and how that interacts with, you know, the material actual world. Bonnie talks about this a lot too, um, um, in virtuality, uh, in distinction, but in coordination with the actual. I think she uses a lot of Bashkar in her arguments for this. So coming back down to the practical level of how our models get in the way, when we have strictly hierarchical models that base development on necessary and sufficient conditions, which is a very modernist notion of how math and the universe works. Apparently, up to date, current cognitive and neuroscientific research, that's not how our brains work and that's not how we perceive. We perceive much more in this interweaving, interconnected notion of domains, which I brought up in the beginning of this discussion, how spirituality intersects with economics, which intersects with, you know, phenomenology. It's more about the connections than it is about stacking levels on top of each other, or the model that Wilbur uses, the nesting hierarchy, they're inside of each other. Uh, like Evan Johnson talks about, and Mark Edwards talks about this as being the, um, what, what is uh, Edwards calls it? He calls it the, um, cause he has, he has also take like, like Evan Johnson takes in his meta theory takes um, account of the various, what he calls lenses. And what um, like Evan Johnson calls the various metaphors for how we interpret reality. And the uh, developmental lens is just one of many, but integral models tend to use that as the defining lens that all else must subsume to. Whereas it's a plurality of lenses. And for Mark Redress, how do those lenses interrelate as opposed to which is the dominating lens like Evan Johnson also call, talks about how 
we uh, philosophers can take a dominating metaphor, one of which is the um, container image schema, which is exactly like what's contained inside. One level is it's subsumed in another, in another, and another, the whole on model. Well, that's just one of many image schemas that develop into metaphors of philosophies of how we look at the world. So another reason I like Bruce Elderman's work is he also combines a lot of this work to show um, a plurality of approaches and a plurality of models and how we can perceive and look at the world. But how then do we find some form of synthesis for lack of a better world and how those various image schema or in lenses, how do they interact in a meta theory? And Mark Edwards has a completely different idea of meta theory than traditional integral models. And I highly recommend his uh, PhD dissertation, which he turned into a book where he goes into great detail about that. And also some of which he goes into a 2015 article on integral review on sin integration or disintegration using uh, metaphors as bridges. Again, bridges talks about the spaces between um, and that there is no overriding ideology that controls them all. That if there is a center to tensegrity, which is something I've explored in martial arts, which applies can be used to apply to model building, um, the reality is in the integration of the parts and the whole is something that is not complete in itself that continues to expand and grow depending on new elements being involved. I think I've riffed on that enough. <laughs> Yeah, I I, uh, I love where this is heading, and I sense an incredible consonance between what you're saying, Edward and, and Jeremy, about Gebser and object-oriented ontology and this kind of processual, emergent, relational orientation. And one of the things that I really liked about your article in the Commons, uh, Edward, we talked about like Jeremy Rifkin and you know all the all these other thinkers, was about um, kind of the stuckness that we are, and and that can be. Uh, uh, propounded or, or kind of reinforced by conscious capitalism, uh, in that we're trying to we're trying to move towards a teal or, or integral world, but we're expressing that new consciousness structure through a lower economic system. And I, I love the way that you you put that. And to me, one of the uh, problems I think with too much abstraction models is that they can kind of kill our creativity. Right, it can become harder to really imagine what's going to emerge or what's to come next as a structural system. And I think part of the hangup for a lot of people is that they're they can't really envision. And this is kind of getting into like Mark Fisher, what he talks about, you know, capitalist realism, and, and uh, Ursula K. Le Guin was saying about we can't really imagine what comes after capitalism. And so people get very scared that whatever is being proposed is going to be some kind of regressive totalitarian Soviet Union kind of thing. And so I think that I, so personally, I put a huge stock on do our models and systems allow for creative emergence to happen in our, in our conversations with each other, in our own thinking about reality. And I think really presenting a coherent reality, which I, I just finished uh, Bowen's uh, book on the peer-to-peer um, -peer in the commons very short book, but very densely packed. And it gives such a coherent vision of w where to go and how to get there. And I, I think that if we can just kind of mainline, mainstream these visions and put some energy into doing that, then people will not be as afraid and it will, it will allow more creative thinking about our future to emerge so that we don't default into integral must be uh, conscious capitalism, right? We're trying to, we, we, we can really think Quant in quantum leaps and not just try to instantiate the emerging consciousness in our existing broken paradigm. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Um, though this, this, this really highlights um, an important point for what we're trying to do in this podcast, which is the economic 
and institutional models that we use to to borrow from McLuhan. These are these are media ecologies. These are environments that are designed and orchestrated and were innovated over the past few centuries, and they have an effect. Like this is what this is what the left is always talking about. These economic models and institutions have an effect on what they call ideology, but also on our consciousness. Mark Fisher is always talking about this, how culturally capitalism has an effect and a capturing effect on our imagination, on the social imaginary. So to really understand this, like again, at the Gibsarian level of, you know, a phenomenology which produces an economic system, which perpetuates itself, which is this feedback loop, this dynamic interactive processual way of looking at theory, economy, culture, consciousness can be very liberating for us, right? Like th these are the, the fissures and the liminal spaces that we can actually access and perhaps produce a different, if only for a moment, a different social imaginary, right? Because we're entering different modes of time and space. We are um, in, in some sense rendering transparent the so-called you know, material basis of politics to some of the underlying thought structures, time-space relations that produced that economic system. And in some sense, liberating ourselves from being stuck in it or perpetuating it. So um, I think Integral you know, has the opportunity to be one of these um, profoundly catalytic and transformative just by being in proximity to these theories, if they're presented in the right way, if they're more than just theory, then you know, we could be that dangerous social imaginary psychoactive that radicalizes people, you know, like just, just by displacing us out of the capture because there are zones where capture is, uh, is in a certain sense suspended and um, this is actually that it came up in the recent podcast with uh, Connor Habib and uh, Shreko Horvat. And I really, I'm really liking Shreko's work. He wrote um, uh, Poetry from the Future and another book about love and revolution. And uh, he, they ended up talking about very Gibsarian way um, how there are these liminal zones or intermediary zones where time and space can be shifted. And since our economic ideology of capitalism has a very particular way of looking at space, right? And a very particular way of looking at time as quantity and highly extractive, as Gepser would say, highly spatializing. If we can get into those fundamentals, right? Like it requires our cultural imagination to rewrite things as fundamental as time and space in order to supersede this capitalist system. So I'm just riffing on this. I think it's just, it's very important to talk about economy and the commons and alternative currencies and alternative ways of looking at time and space to actually in, engender these, this new culture. Um, and, and to the degree that I think integral theory is, is capable of doing that, um, we've been kind of focusing more on organizational development and like conscious capitalism or like coaching entrepreneurs and that kind of thing. And that's fine, but like we could do more than that. We, we, we have more than that in our, in our basis and in our theory. Um, so yeah, that's one of my like primary motivations for this podcast is just to really kind of bring out the radicality of some of our thinking. Did you guys read, um, have you read any Terry Patton? Because it seems like I've read a little bit of him, not a lot, but seems like that's part of his um, current project is how to implement integral ideas into policy and political activism. So I think perhaps he is one of the driving forces being one of the bigger names in the movement in the Bay Area of at least uh, presenting the notion of political engagement in the integral community which heretofore has been seen as a, a tainted green, mean green meme activity. So I, I'm encouraged by him at least moving in that direction. But also Jeremy mentioned the liminal and Zach Stein wrote a recent article on his blog, uh, something like about the time or space between worlds, how we are in that space right now between you know how capitalism is being exposed for what it is 
and we don't quite know where we're going, but being in between worlds like that is an opportunity to start writing the narrative for the new world. And I think in that regard, Michelle and uh, some other writers are providing a, a huge database of information along those lines. The Commons Transition is another one. Jeremy Rifkin is another one um, of showing us where we can go. And not only where we can go, where we have already been going. One of the things I appreciate about P2P Foundation and Jeremy Rifkin is we've already taken, many of us have already taken practical steps along implementing what this overall vision indicates um, as a prime example of what we're here today on the internet, sharing information. We're not going to you know, major media. We're not going to experts to tell us what it is. This collaborative commons of ideas just right now is an example of how this shift is happening um, I think Michelle wrote an old article many years ago, the next Buddha will be a collective. We don't always look to heroes and experts anymore, even though we can take their information and their opinion. We, the people, kind of share information and work it out amongst ourselves. Comments? Yeah, I mean, sort of to kind of wrap this all up, I think we started off with sort of the idea of do models get in the way and something that's in my head is, uh, you know, thinking of it as a map is it only gets in the way if it doesn't get us to where we want to go. And the second part of that question is, well, where is it we're trying to get to? And I think, you know, a lot of this can be seen as, you know, Ryan's brought this up before is a, crit a criticism of integral is that we're all talk. And I think we could all be talking about, well, you know, all the different things that gets into eventually, where are we trying to get to? What does that look like? What is that vision? What is that vision? Is it collectively shared? Um, is it coherent? And, um, you know, right now, I think, you know, all, it's uh, talking about that time in between worlds is everyone discussing about what is that common vision that we have and um those are my those are my kind of final thoughts well i've provided one version of that in the collaborative commons i think michelle also has that uh, hansi has green social liberalism 2.0 uh, we have you know the better modern movement we have Game B, although I'm not that familiar with Game B. So we have a lot of people struggling to define what this, where we want to go. And there are, there's plenty of evidence of we're already on the way going there. So part of my endeavor will be to contribute to the modeling of where we want to go in addition to talking to my working class demographic on how we can provide the conditions necessary to get to where we want to go. Yeah, I think that's a big piece about how, how do we connect? And I think the growing it down ideas, I mean, we've talked about some really heady stuff. Um, how, how do you connect that to people that are overwhelmed by the uncertainty of what might lie in the future. When we talk about shaking up a system that has nurtured us or at least been with us for so long and we're talking about throwing that out, so, so to speak, and replacing it with something else, I think there's also that fear of the unknown. And a lot of times people will ease into the certainty of what they already know rather than take that quantum leap as Ryan was talking about into this, into this uncertain realm and, um, you know, sort of, not knowing what you're getting when you jump there. Well, and that's also what happened with Bernie. We all know that the policies he talks about, as well as AOC and the squad, 
repeated polling shows that this is what the majority of Americans, including people that I identify as Republican, want. Medicare for all, uh, living wage, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I support and will continue to support and fight for people like Bernie and Warren and the squad, because this is how we connect our lofty ideals and models where the rubber hits the road of you know, socioeconomics. And Bernie, Warren, AOC all do a great job of connecting to those people. So that's why I try to emulate them in my communications with a broader working class community and not talk about higher and higher anarchical complexity because they'll just go, what the fuck? So I, you know, talk about bread and butter issues and, and how those policies can satisfy your bread and butter issue. How Medicare for all in this time of crisis can help you to pay for, since you're out of a job, millions of people are out of a job now. How are they gonna pay for their treatment? Well, plenty of suggestions are out there. Well, let's suspend, let's have the government pay for their treatment right now. And if we can get that passed, well then people go, I like that. After the pandemic's over, we want Medicare for all and we will have it now. So translating down our models into practical political action of what's going on in the current situation. And to me, that's how we get there. Yeah, just to just to add in one more thing, uh, when it comes to, I think when it comes to strategy or, or concrete plans of action moving forward. Just to echo what Matt was saying, you know, in psychology, there's a term called like frustration tolerance capacity or something. I think we should have another one called liminal tolerance capacity and our ability to really be comfortable in times of transition and the unknown. And if that's not, I think if that's not managed well on the collective level, there's a huge tendency towards authoritarianism and, and a, a kind of a reactionary doubling down on things that are familiar or secure to us. We have to go backwards, make America great again, right? And to really have a vision that goes into the future, one thing I found important is that, like, for example, the word post-capitalism really freaks the hell out of a lot of people. There's a huge reaction of like, oh my God, you know, what is, what is going to come next? And what I try to, when I talk to people, which I'll hopefully demonstrate well on the Growing Down Sideshow, is that if you really find what people's core values and needs and identities are, as you were saying, Edward, you can say, okay, these are all really important. You're not going to lose these. They'll just be re-expressed in a different form in the new system, in the new paradigm, right? You're not going to, your identity and values are not going to be obliterated. Uh, they'll just be re-expressed in a slightly different way. And it may take some getting used to, but don't worry, I, I, I'm here to catch you, so to speak. And just to give a concrete example, one of the things I've, I know a lot of conservatives or more centrist, uh, pro-capitalist folks talk about is how capitalism is the spirit of innovation and creativity. It's what made America great, right? It's a very kind of Joseph Schumpeter kind of take on capitalism. And, and my response is, yeah, that's true. And the collaborative commons and this open sourced, transparent, um, what, what, was, what was the term of like the uh, uh, commons licensing, right? Where, where we're kind of doing away with these confines of intellectual property as they've been traditionally implemented and having a more collaborative, emergent, shared paradigm. That's going to be creativity and innovation on steroids, right? That's going to be all of those things that made capitalism great are going to be re-expressed at a higher, healthier, more sustainable level. So just tr trying to, you know, as Jeremy always says, translate between value spheres, and, and remix uh, old ideas in new forms, I think is kind of the project I'm most uh, enthusiastic about. Well said, Ryan. Um, yeah, I think, I think for my part, I just, I'm just in a lot of resonance with what you guys have said and, um, you know, always coming back down to what are the immediate realities in our environment, in um, the working class, how can we help? Right. How can we get involved and how can we make sure that we don't lose um, inspiration, right? Like getting involved in, let's say, the formation of labor unions or down ballot votes. I mean, this this is part of 
this is sort of what the, the visionary aspect of integral and consciousness culture has, like seeing what we're doing on the ground as immediately related in the future as a kind of a latent possibility to these better worlds, right? Like Charles Eisenstein calls the more beautiful world we can imagine or uh, a post-capitalist civilization. Um, everything we're doing right now is the part of that. So, you know, where it's applicable, let's help, you know, create, let's unionize, uh, I don't know, freelancers and um, fight for Amazon workers' rights, you know. Um, and also enact, you know, get involved in particular, like, common-centric um, alternative currencies. Like, we, there's so much we can do on the ground right now. And there's a sense of coherence for what that is because of the vision that we're all kind of sharing in terms of what is emerging. So... As integralists, again, I think we're, we have the unique possibility and potential to be immediately present and involved as well as visionarily present and anticipatory, right? Like everything we're doing is prefigurative and that's fine because the present is, has the future in it in these activities. And I think it's really good to have to kind of hold that temporal sense to, um, to not lose hope, right? And not lose... Um, a sense of connection to the larger process that we're a part of. So awesome guys. And thank you, Edward. Amen. All right. Thanks, thanks a lot, <laughs> Edward. <laughs> thank you. Guys. We got to have you back on sometime. This was great. Edward, can you share a little bit about if people want to find you where they can find your work or um, your blog? Um, I, I'm on Facebook. And also my blog is called Proactive Progressive Populism. You just put those three words in parentheses and search, I will be the first thing that comes up. Great, yeah, awesome. we'll share that in the notes. Thanks again, Edward. Thank you. Thank you.